the wildlife. Stories of humanity's original skills, told from the perspective of the people who love them. In September of 2017, Hurricane Maria hit St. Croix as a Category 5 with maximum sustained winds of 175 miles per hour. The eye wall of the storm passed just off the western shore close to where Matt and Carmen live. It moved across the northeastern Caribbean focusing on Dominica, St. Croix, and Puerto Rico, causing widespread destruction and many deaths. The ecological damage was intense as reef, forest, and coastline were all dramatically impacted. Seven months after the storm, the land is growing over, but signs still remain. Back on the hunt for fresh fruits, we make our way into the heart of the bush to the abandoned mansion destroyed by the last major hurricane to hit St. Croix. In 1989, Hugo, a powerful Category 4 hurricane, destroyed this house and left plenty of abandoned fruit trees, making it a repeat foraging location for our friends. After the damages of Maria, this time we don't do so well, finding only a few old coconuts. Eight months later, over a full year after the hurricane, we return to the mansion to a forager's dream. Two common elements of foraging in St. Croix are Matt hacking at vines to caretake the trees so they produce more fruit, and climbing the trees to get as many as he can. Hey, Dad, did you get thorned up? No. Why? I was careful, and they only stepped on the branches that... The bigger branches don't have thorns. The final common thread is Eileen who handily devours a wide variety of fruits, seeds, nuts, and wild edibles as a part of her daily diet. This is soursop, my personal favorite. We also found sour oranges and small sweet bananas. It was honestly almost too much to carry. It was encouraging to see this bounty when eight months before we had found almost nothing. At that time, we needed to play to Matt's knowledge of the island and the storm to find mature coconuts, as they are the main ingredient to fresh coconut milk, a staple for their family. We headed up a gut on the far northwest coast in search of wind-protected trees. Coconut trees are like iconic of it's, tropical living. It's like, besides bananas, it's probably like the number one plant that people think of when they think about the tropics, coconut trees. They, they provide a ton. We got natural sports drink with electrolytes. We got sugars. We got nutrients and minerals, tons of potassium, fats, carbohydrates. Thatching material, basketry material, cordage material. I mean, this is like many feet of rope if we were to process this. That's not even counting the husk, which is even more feet of rope. So it's a high energy burn, but it's worth it. 10 to 15,000 calories at least. So it should be worth the calorie burn. Yeah. I was climbing like monkey style, and then about two thirds of the way up, my hands got really sweaty. So I switched to that like bear hug climb, which is way more of an energy burn, but I just didn't want to slip, so made it more worth it to just bear hug it and go the rest of the way up. But yeah, this is a great spot to come um, for these mature coconuts. We could have had these uh, like less mature coconuts for that has the soft meat for drinking. We can get those a lot of places on island right now, but after the storm, the only places that have these mature coconuts are places that protected that are protected by the wind. So the winds in the storm were out of the southeast coming this way. So 
obviously the winds like kind of skipped over these these little um, east-west facing valleys and preserved all these coconuts. These things made it through the storm. So all of this like te te texture and bashing right here, this is all from it just getting just beaten up during the storm. But uh, yeah, pretty pretty tough plants, pretty hardy, uh, pretty hardy fruits. And this is a great spot to collect them from if you're going to be away from the beach. But they don't sink in the ground hardly at all. So a lot of these in the storm that were prone to the heavy winds, especially the ones that weren't on the beach, a lot of them blew over because the roots come up so easily. Oh, wow. Because so. they seem so built for that tropical landscape being on beaches, hurricanes coming through. Totally. They had those like leaflets that are split so the wind can pass through. They smack of being resilient as far as like post-hurricane, huge bounty of food. Well, this falls off during a hurricane, You've got less time to get to it, but you've got at least a month. After the storm, it was about a month, month and a half that I was still able to gather coconuts every day. Uh, but if they sit on the ground, like this one's been sitting kind of in the water, so you could see this part's wet. So in the water it would be fine, but if this thing were to just wash up right onto the ground and, and not be in the water anymore, this thing would immediately start sprouting. So you can eat sprouted coconuts, but a lot of times, let's say of, of 50 coconuts, about 20 of them will probably sprout, and the other 30, just for whatever reason, they don't put a sprout out. And once it starts to put the sprout out and can't finish putting the sprout out, then moisture gets in and it rots the coconut and it's no good. So you got about a month after the storm, but that's still pretty good. There's not many fruits that can fall, and a month later you can still eat it. No. Um, so, yeah, the natural ecology is for this to live on the beach, fall down, roll towards the ocean, get washed up by a wave, or picked up by a wave, wash over to the next island or to the next beach, wash up and sprout and grow there. So pretty sweet packaging, comes with its own packaging. On the hike out of the valley, I'm surprised again by the weight of this many coconuts, but happy to carry it all the same. On our way back to camp, we score some oyster mushrooms living in a beetle-eaten gumbo limbo tree along the coast. They look and smell just like the ones we harvest back in Vermont. While Matt gathered them up, I discovered a calabash tree to my sheer excitement. The calabash is an odd fruit with a hard rind that makes lightweight in strong bowls, ladles, and water vessels. The northern coast of St. Croix is something to behold. The swells often come in strong, and where there is not a sandy beach, razor rock cliffs and tide pools meet the sea. It is a beautiful and rugged place, and a perfect backdrop for the survival trips Matt and Carmen lead here. It looks exactly like we have a shelter in Vermont. And so the functions are the same, the design principles are the same, they always kind of smell the same. But materials are wholly different, landscape, we're in a rainforest. Yeah, you know, principles. This is perfect for here, really steep shelter so that it can shed the rain really easily. So, I feel like moving through the woods, there's not too many bugs that are really worrisome or scary, but do people come in for survival trips with that as a concern? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Besides snakes, I'd probably call it the number one hated thing for people in the tropics. I mean, mosquitoes are everywhere. That's just Well, a mosquitoes given. are everywhere in the rainy season. Really what you need to watch out for on smaller Caribbean islands is what they call a mampi here, like a sandfly, a noceum. So we avoid the beaches for shelter areas because of that. I mean, it's cool and that makes it relaxing. The ground is flat. It's really ideal, but we're also just elevated upon one of the most beautiful beaches. Yeah, and it, just the whole area, it's central to the whole to, to a lot of resources. This area is really great. We got the, the tide pools, you can get lobster, you can get whelk, which you know, we weren't here in the evening is usually when you get the whelk. But we got the nearites, the bleeding tooth nearite that we gathered out there. There's sea purslane all over the rocks. 
and there's lots of stones for stone tools so the whole area is it's a really rich area for doing survival trip yeah yeah so. I mean, materials and working with your landscape and that we have like the diversity of landscapes that provide and offer so much. Mm. It's pretty stellar. Yeah, the one thing is water. You know, it's definitely a challenge on these smaller islands we were talking about the other day. And usually in a spot like this that's a little bit drier, you can still find a little pocket of a seep, a little spring in the guts. And I'll usually take that and filter it or boil it, yeah. depending on how fast it's moving and where it's flowing to. Yeah, not a bad idea. But you know, and like we talk about survival, and then I'm thinking like there's lobsters cooked with coconut milk with some sea purslane <laughs> and some pyros in your eyes, and it's kind of like this is like. Is this really survival? <laughs> That's a big part of the reason why we moved here is just the richness of the land. That even in a down year like this year, where we don't have access to nearly as much food, there's still so much wild food on the landscape, like those nearites. I mean, you just walk out and pick them. There's so many of them that you can just, you could eat them for quite a while at a reasonable rate and get more than enough protein. You know, so long as you're aiming for the right size fish and lobster, there's plenty of, you know, food to eat in yeah. the water. It's always been hard for me harvesting animals from the landscape. And it's so hard to get over that hump for so many people because you don't feel the same about plants because they grow everywhere and you feel like you could plant new ones. Or a lot of times you're not killing the plant Mm -hmm. For me, it's always been a little bit hard for killing the animals. When I'm on a survival trip, I really just sink into that survival mind. Yeah. And it, there's something else that sort of takes over. It's a lot easier to catch stuff. It's true. So, and easier to deal with that, taking that life. Being like, well, I haven't eaten serious calories in a day and a half, and I'm hungry. I'm going to eat them. I'm thankful for it, and I'm going to eat it. <laughs> Yeah, and now like invasives, you can you can harvest them and it like eases the conscience a little bit more, but that's still not to say that it's not a unique individual life. So that's why we make like mongoose the focus and lionfish the focus of our collection mm -hmm. because it's so abundant and you're helping the landscape. Recently, it seems like there's more and more people who are showing interest in these skills and there are schools throughout and that people kind of like hold on to certain sort of strengths. For us as a school, survival, just the survival experience is kind of our strength. Because in part of where we live, we favor an abundant survival mindset mm -hmm. for our classes. As a teacher of survival skills, you can go with the hardcore, I'm going to push these students and I'm going to push myself to see how, how much they can endure and how much they can survive. Or you can approach it from the viewpoint of, let's see how much we can thrive. Let's yeah. see how much we can, you know, fit in with this landscape and and be happy to be here. And that's what we've always focused on. That's always been my focus as a student of these skills is the actual survival day to day, which covers so many of the other skills. But it, it feels different from sitting and being in a controlled environment and just making bows, which I love to do. That's almost one skill set separate from, whoa, what am I going to do? I don't have this handy knife on me or anything else and I've got to make fire from the landscape or I'm going to freeze or well I mean here you're not going to freeze <laughs> but I need to boil my water that's that's a totally different experience so we focus on that kind of raw survival experience personally and as teachers like the experience we're trying to give as a school but with that raw survival mindset also how can we go out in this raw survival situation but it's going to feel abundant Mm -hmm. and we're going to almost regret having to leave on the last day because it's been such a magical experience. Usually that's how it goes. For me personally, there's never been a time where I've returned from one of these trips and haven't felt like it was almost like a dream. I'm someone who likes to sit down and weave a basket, but you don't find those sublime and transcendent experiences like you do where you're like, maybe you're a little hungry and you just stumbled upon some mushrooms and you're Ugh. stoked and you bring them back to the group yeah, and everyone's get like, get that Ooh. lobster in that instant. It's just this, <laughs> they get some discomfort along with that, <laughs> with that magical mind. But that's know? like, it, like thinking back about the landscape, you know, in some ways you could just like sit back in perfect weather and eat papaya and mango <laughs> with limes all day long. So that there can be like these like stunningly beautiful moments, but then there can also be, uh, like the landscape can be brutal too. I love that about the tropics. It's the most sublime thing that if you can find your comfort level, 
it's the most amazingly beautiful thing and, and you can relax and just the amount of calories you save from not shivering mm -hmm. or needing to, you know, you, you burn a lot of calories when you're, it's cold. Yeah. So if you can find that level and be comfortable enough with the stinging, the biting, the scratching, it's an amazing place to, to do survival at, to immerse yourself in the landscape. I mean, and you gotta really take care of yourself. And every environment has that those harsh notes, like for Vermont, the winter, we have poison ivy, like you have Christmas rush. Mm -hmm. And then that experience of like how you then fold into it as a human being and why it's so exhilarating as an adventure and a challenge, is like enlightening to who you are as a person. It's so significant, especially when we come out of man-made environments where everything is like mm -hmm. very squared off, very flat, very air conditioned, very comfortable. People hunger for that. Yeah. They hunger for that edge, but they're afraid to tempt it. It's really it's, nice to have a guide. Well, sometimes, exactly, because sometimes people go the opposite, and they're like, I'm going to go to a tropical island that's deserted and just be there by myself for a week or two. But just having other people around to say, hey, here come some waves. Look out while you're collecting those near heights. You're about to get nailed. You know? <laughs> I do think about how, you know, people rattle off with survival, shelter, water, fire, food, and tools. And yet that list like doesn't stop there. And like, where do you put musical instruments and jokes? <laughs> where do you put jokes? Jokes, well, I think, I, come right after know, tools. Attitude's supposed to be even before- All of it. Shelter, water, fire, food, yeah. in a way. So I see the musical instrument and the, and the conversation or the storytelling is part of that attitude. Mm -hmm. When you strip that all away and do a survival immersion, really easy to actually feel the human companionship yeah even though it's all around us when we're in a city it's all around us we don't get that because there's a, things between us so survival is an amazing amazing tool don't get me wrong there's plenty of people that you just want to strangle <laughs> <laughs> on day one quarter <laughs> and you're like this dude we're not both oh. making it out of this <laughs> He's pretty big, but I hope it's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good yeah. times. As much as we love the landscape in St. Croix, there's a whole other world to see here. We take a breath and dive. And there is so much life. And there is so much beauty. And wonder. Here there are a million ingenious adaptations for survival. from the brightest colors to the most deceptive camouflage. And it seems infinite and wild and alien. But it's fragile and we've seen it damaged in a very short time. Runoff, bleaching, pollution, you see it all. The ocean needs us to choose to protect it because humans are the ones destroying it with the big choices and with the little ones. This is a thriving community. of grace that we get to be a part of for a short time when we venture into the sea. It is at once vast and empty and at the same time home to beautiful and amazing creatures. is 
elemental. It is where all life starts and ends. Us and the sea, together, or alone. Living these moments that we will never forget. Thanks for joining us as we explore the places, people, and the skills the show is all about.